And I am from Scotland, so I have a Scottish accent. So we must an English one. So I still think so. So if you have any questions at any point, please, please do let me know. And I'm happy to take questions. The purpose of this session is to talk about business intelligence in SQL Azure. So that's who I am. My name is Jennifer Stirrup. I've been a SQL Server MVP for almost a year. Probably because they haven't found me out yet. It's probably should go to someone else, but never mind. I'm here. So, what I'd like to do today has anybody used SQL Server Azure? Okay. There's only three or four hands in the audience. So, I'm going to assume that everyone is a beginner, and that's fine. It's in the purpose of the presentation is for beginners. So, I had to learn this too. I wasn't born knowing this. So I'm hoping to pass some of this information to you so that you can learn it more quickly than I did. Yeah? Okay. We'll see. We'll see. I'm sure you will. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I would like to tell you a bit about SQL Azure. I'll take you through the database and how it's structured in Azure. We'll talk about how we can use the Business Intelligence Development Studio and SQL Server Data Tools in Azure as well. Has anybody used SQL Server 2012? A few hands, okay. Not too many. That's okay. I assume that SQL Server 2012 is new to most people, so that's fine. So first of all, we'll have a quick introduction to SQL Server Azure. Okay. So basically, SQL Server Azure is cloud computing. It's an operating system in the cloud. So the way that I best understand Azure is that it's like a locked down production system. Basically one which you don't manage because a DBA manages it for you. Now, instead of that DBA being on site, the DBA tends to be someone from Microsoft. Microsoft offer this platform for you to use, and it's reasonably cheap. So Microsoft have got a number of data centers all over the world, and when you have an Azure account, and an Azure server, an Azure database, it will be held inside one of these Microsoft data centers. They have them in Chicago, Dublin, Amsterdam, and there's a number of them in America. You're probably wondering why there's a data center in Dublin, and the reason for that is it's cold, so they don't have to spend so much time and energy on cooling the servers because we're already cold in Ireland and the UK, yeah? yeah. It's, not good for you. <laughs> it's not good for us, but it's great for the computers. <laughs> okay, so you're probably wondering why am I showing you a big blue box with HP on it? Believe it or not, the cloud servers are actually stored inside these containers. And when you connect to Azure, you connect into something that's stored inside something that looks a bit like Doctor Who's TARDIS. Does anyone know Doctor Who? A few hands. It's a science fiction character. And here's what the containers look like. The idea is that Microsoft manage everything for you. You probably already have remote access to servers and your organizations that are in different locations from where you are. And Azure is the same. It's a bit like a production environment that Microsoft look after for you. And that's what it looks like. Nice photo. And that's what it looks like inside. Ooh, it looks nice and flashy, doesn't it? If you like hardware like me, then this will be really interesting for you. And this is how it looks, yeah? So you can imagine that trying to get inside one of these containers, you would have to really know what you're doing. 
But the idea is that Microsoft look after the servers for you. You don't need to do very much. What you're actually doing is converting capital expenditure into operational expenditure. So if you're starting a new business, you often don't have a large outlay to spend on capital expenditure. So what you might want to do is to stretch and flex your environment. You don't have a lot of money to spend on computers, but what you can do is do pay as you go, which is a bit like paying your electricity bill. You pay for what you use and when you use it, okay? And that's it. All you need to do to have an Azure account is a Windows Live ID and a credit card. Can you imagine how dangerous that is in the hands of a business user? They'll be setting up servers all over the place, setting up databases all over the place. They're going to have great fun with their new toy and their servers which are located in other parts of the world. So I think with Azure, the important thing to notice is that Azure is coming and it's good to learn skills about Azure so that you are riding the wave. What I mean by this is, is that you will be one of the first people with Azure skills in business intelligence and that's really important, I think, for our skill sets. So don't be afraid of Azure. It is a different way of working. It just means Microsoft are looking after it for you so that you don't have to do much, okay? You can concentrate on growing and developing your business, your enterprise, rather than actually worrying too much about IT, okay? So there's a number of data storage options when we use SQL Server. Down here, on the left-hand side, we have a SQL Azure database. And what that is, it's hosted and looked after by Microsoft for you. So essentially, Microsoft become your DBAs, yeah? Only a bit more friendly and a bit a little less grouchy, yeah? So in the middle, what you can have is your hosted RDBMS, your hosted database, which is in between the cloud and also your on-premise server as well. And then at the top, we have SQL Server on-premise, which is fine, which we all know and we all love. But what I'd like to show you here is that we have a number of options for storing our data. And the idea is that your Azure database has got very low control. Yeah? You don't have much control over it because the stewards of your servers are Microsoft, yeah? <coughs> not you. And then you, the opposing situation is SQL Server on-premise where you have high control over your databases. There are pros and cons to each situation, but the main thing to remember is that Azure is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It's very good for certain things, such as growing your business for your projects. But some data can't be held in the cloud. In the UK, we have the National Health Service, and some of their patient data cannot be clouded, can't be held in the cloud. So we need on-premise SQL Server for that. But the advantage of having skills in both areas, both Azure and SQL Server on-premise, is that you can wear different hats at different times, yeah? And it allows you to look after yourself in terms of your skill set. So to summarise, SQL Azure is a simple storage and hosted database which Microsoft look after for you. I held this presentation recently in Dallas and a lot of people seem to think that SQL Azure was a server that they could RDP onto and it's not really like that. What we have instead is we have a browser where you can access your database. You can also access it using in Business Intelligence Development Studio as well. You can also use it with reporting services. Yeah. But it's not the same as RDPing onto a server. Instead of connecting to a database using a server name, you connect to it using a URL. You use a link. It's a bit different and I'm going to show you how that works today. Okay. So now we've laid the framework of what cloud computing is, I'd like to move on to more of the SQL Server architecture. So just to emphasise the last point, you can actually, when you use cloud SQL Server Azure, 
as your source systems, you could have an on-premises server or you could have a cloud server as well. Then what you can do is move your data using integration services. You can move it from the cloud via SSIS out to the cloud again. Or what you can do is mix it up a bit. So you could have source data being lifted by SSIS and then exported out to the cloud. And of course the converse exists as well, where you can have cloud SQL Server Azure data, which is picked up by your on-premise SSIS server and then taken down to your SQL Server on-premise. Okay. So your source and your target can both be cloud and both be SQL Server. Just because you're using SQL Server doesn't mean you have to host all of your data there. Yeah. Okay. So there's a bit more specific information about the architecture. You can actually write applications using Windows Azure, which is the .NET framework, and then you can could host your data in SQL Azure as well if you like. Yeah. So there's all sorts of flexibility there. And what I would really recommend you do is just try out the free Azure account. You get it free for 30 days. And then after that, you have to pay quite a low cost if you want to keep using it. You pay for what you use, but the best way to learn something is to just sign up with an Azure account, a live ID, and just try it for yourselves. Yeah. I'll make these slides available at the end of the session, so you're quite welcome to use them, play with them, and try it out, and contact me if you've got any questions. Okay. So very simply, this is what happens when you have an Azure account. At the very top, you've got account, and it's basically a Windows Live ID. Each Windows Live ID can have a number of users associated with it. I'm currently working for an organization just now, which has a number of Windows Live IDs and users associated with it, which are then using Azure as a data source. So there's some very exciting things, people are starting to use it. So I'm quite happy I'm starting to see customers using Azure as well. So your server is hosted on the cloud. It could be actually hosted anywhere. We can, I'll show you the geography locations. And then we've got the database as well. Now the database, you don't have much control over it in terms of its scalability and performance. The idea is that Microsoft do it all for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So it's quite an important thing because it allows you to focus on what the data is telling you rather than worrying too much about IT. I think also it allows you to, if you want to just try a project just to see if it works, it allows you quite a low cost trial platform. So that means you don't have to invest a lot of time and money buying hardware, investing skills and staff, buying licenses to try a project which might ultimately fail. Now you and I both know as business intelligence professionals that business intelligence projects have got a high rate of failure. Yeah. I think the failure rate sometimes is quoted as 85%. Huge failure. So the idea is if you are starting a business intelligence project, you can minimise the risk to your organisation by not having to lay out a lot of capital expenditure for a project which you're not sure is going to succeed. My own opinion is that when a business intelligence project fails, it's normally due to people, not technology. So requirements are not well defined. The technology has been mismatched to the requirements, for example. And false promises have been made by salespeople somewhere, sometimes. So I think what's really important is to try to maximise the success of business intelligence projects. And Azure can help you to do a more agile approach where you suck it and see. Try it and see how it works. It's the best way. Okay. So I'm just going to skip through some of this because we've talked about it, or I've talked about it. Okay. So what I would like to do is show you that you're already using cloud software. I've got a friend who sells cloud software. What she says is, the easiest way to sell cloud is not to mention the word cloud at all. 
because people have a lot of preconceived ideas of what cloud is. So if you have something like an Office Live account, you use Bing, or even Xbox Live, any Xbox people in the audience? A few? Yeah. Well, that means this has to see three modding heads. Yeah, that woke everyone up. Well, <laughs> so if you use Xbox, you're using cloud already. Yeah. So it's quite important to realise, I think, that even smartphones, I read recently that every smartphone uses at least one cloud application. Yeah. So even if you don't think you're using cloud very often, it's probably in, stuck in your back pocket using the cloud and you're not realising it. Yeah. Okay, so the summary is that SQL Server Azure allows Microsoft to administer a lot of the DBA work around your database in order to help your business intelligence project to succeed. Okay. So what I'd like to do, rather than PowerPoint you to death, is show you a quick um, demo of SSIS and the cloud. What I'd like to do is I'll just show you the structure of it first so you can see it. And what we can do is we can log on to the Windows uh, browser. We can use Windows Azure, log on. And then we see the SQL Azure servers. And then we have the database down here as well. So if you bear with me. I'm going to try and bring up a browser. And we'll have a quick look at the SQL Server, the SQL Server Azure interface. If I can get in the internet, just thinking about it. Okay. It's always thinking about it. Right. So at this point, I wish you could sing or something that entertain people by the boat or so. If it doesn't work, I'll just go straight to the demo. Okay. What I'll do instead is I'll log on to the server. This is a virtual machine which is running on my box here. I'll just go back to the browser, there it is. I'm very, very, very happy to see it. So if you want to sign up for an account to try it, you go to windowsazure.com. <coughs> yeah. And you get a nice metro-like appearance. The sign-in is on the right-hand side, which always confuses me a little bit, but there it is. And you log in with your Windows Live ID if it appears. If not, it's fine, we'll just go back. Alright. What I'll do instead is we'll wait for that to rack up and in the meantime I'll take you through SSIS and Spatial Services. Now, has anybody seen SQL Server Data Tools in SQL Server 2012? Not many? Just a few? Okay. That's fine. So what I'll do is, while my internet is thinking about it, what I'll do is I'll take you a quick tour of the SQL Server data tools. Has anybody used SQL Server 2008 Humans 2 Business Intelligence Development Studio? More. Okay, that's about half the audience. So if you already use BIDS, then this will be familiar to you. Yeah. So it's quite similar to what we have already. Okay, it's thinking about it as well. Wow. Right, while that's working up, I'll log in to my live ID. Right, okay. So for those of you that haven't used it before, this is the SQL Server Data Tools. So it's hosted in Visual Studio. 
And that what's nice about the fact it's hosted in Visual Studio is that it means there's a common interface for development for different things. So what we have here, I'm just going to kill some of these windows so we can see it a bit better. So what we have here is integration services. So that's basically SQL Server 2012 and previous version. That's the way in which Business Intelligence Development Studio allows you to lift data from one source and put it somewhere else. That's very simply what integration services actually does. Now you see it's got a red cross here. And that's probably because it can't see the internet. But this is a control flow task. And basically what the control flow task does is it allows you, it allows, puts everything else into place, is what it does. It tells you when the source should fire and when the data flows should fire. It will take the data from one place and put it somewhere else. So what we have here... I'm going to reduce that down a bit so it looks a bit better. Okay, that's better. So what I have here um, is a very simple data source, which I will show you. This may not mean very much, but what it actually is, is um, in the UK we have census data, and what that means is that they record all sorts of things about UK citizens about once every 10 years. I think they do it in other countries as well. But what the people get upset about is that they ask people their religion. And in the UK, it's not something we talk about very much. So what, we, what the UK people did, instead of answering the question honestly about religion, is um, they started to say that they were Jedi Knights. I assume most people have seen Star Wars. Yeah. So that's what they said their religion was. So what I did was, I took the census data and I put it into SQL Server and what we have here is data that shows us how many Jedi Knights are located in various parts of the UK. So for example, and when we look at Birmingham, it says that the number of people in Birmingham who said they were Jedi Knights was over 5,000. Yeah. Any Jedi Knights in the room? One? <laughs> That's good. Okay, you have one here. So if anything goes wrong with my laptop, hopefully the press will always have to help. <laughs> it is the force. <laughs> Any set? No. I've got two set here in numbers. So what we have is, um, this is a data connector, because basically in SSIS, we've got to tell SQL Server what data it's using at it, as its source, and what data is where the data is going, basically the target. So the data moves from the source, things happen to it, so the data gets cleansed, it gets organised, it gets sanitised, some of it will be merged, for example, to make it nice and tidy, and then the data is popped somewhere. Okay? So what this is that we're now looking at is the source system. And the source is very simply a SQL Server database 2012, which is storing the Jedi Knights data. And what we have here is we'll try this. Now we have a connection manager here which is called Copper Blue. And what that is is actually a data target which is pointing at the cloud. So I'm just going to open it up and show it to you. Okay. So this is a this is where the information is held, where the data is being sent to. So I've called it Copper Blue, which is if you're my age, you know is a music a one of the great CDs of the 1990s by a band called Sugar. And then we've got, that's the server name there. So earlier I said that when you connect to SQL Server in the cloud, you don't use a server name, you use a URL. And that still holds, okay? So if you do start to use SQL Server Azure, remember to use the URL. The only reason you use a server name in SQL Server is because the server is actually on your network. It's something that you can access. 
but the cloud obviously isn't on your network, so that's why you use a URL in order to access it. Yeah? And what you also must do is you must use your Windows Live ID details under SQL Server Authentication in order to access the data source. The reason that you do that is because the SQL Azure is not accessible using your network login ID. You'd be surprised how many people think they can just log in. It's not like that. You have to use Windows Live ID. Now, one issue with that, if I'm being honest, is when I speak to customers about Azure, they, that's a problem for some customers, because they say, I don't want to use separate Azure accounts. I want to use Windows Authentication to do that. So I'm working with someone just now. We're trying to find out different ways that we can do that. So it's just something to be aware of yeah, when you're looking at SQL Server Azure. So what I have here at the very top is a list of the providers which you use in order to access different types of databases. So we have our own favourites, analysis services, we have Oracle, and we have directory services. But if you want to access cloud data, either for writing data to Azure or retrieving data from Azure, you have to use one of the .NET providers, which is SQL Client's data provider. Yeah. So to summarise, you've got three main things to remember, using Azure as a source or as a target. The first thing to remember is use a URL here. Yeah. The second thing to remember, use your SQL Server Live, use your Windows Live ID. It's not in your domain, so you can't use your authentication as you normally would. And the third thing to remember is that your provider is different. It's a .NET provider. Once all of this is in place, you have your database name here. Now, I'm going to test the connection, but I don't think it will work. No, it's not going to work. That's okay. The connectivity and need to sort it, it's not very good. Okay, just thinking about it. Hello, Leah. Uh, this should, this uh, username should be a full uh, email address. Um, you, I found that you can use the full Windows Live ID, or if you use a username, if your username is the same as the Windows Live ID, then it works. Because what you have is a number of windows. Your Live ID can be associated with a number of users. So I'll just repeat the question, because I'm not sure if some people in the back caught it, if that's okay. Uh, the question that we had was, um, what I have here, is a username rather than a Windows Live ID email address. <coughs> so the reason I've got just a username here is because I've set up users to be associated with the Windows Live ID. So you can have a one-to-many relationship. And so the one is the Windows Live ID, which is then associated with a different number of users. Yeah. So you don't need a different live ID for each user, which makes it slightly easier for companies to organize and manage, because they've just got one live ID, and then they've got control over the users the way that they would do normally. Yeah. Okay. So what would normally happen is, if we run this package, it will take data from our SQL Server source and pop it into our SQL Azure database. Yeah. And that's the only difference between using integration services on-premise and SQL Server and SQL Server on-premise integration services. I'm using this for my laptop, and all I'm doing is using SSIS, and all I've done is change the source in the target to use the cloud. That's all I've done. And there's only three main points to remember doing that. So if you're already an SSIS developer who is very familiar with Business Intelligence Development Studio, there's not that much ramp up between using that and the latest in SQL Server 2012, which is SQL Server data tools that we're looking at at the moment, and also just changing those source and those target details. That's all it is. So again, if you sign up for the, for the Azure accounts, just to try it, 
Just try in this SIS package. Just make up a database, a small table, pop some data in it, and you'll see how easy it is. Yeah? I went from knowing absolutely nothing about Azure to having written reports in less than four hours. So I just sat and worked it out all myself. I break things, and then I go back and try and fix it, and that's how I learn things. But so I'm hoping that I can try to share some of this information with you. So that um, you don't break as much as I did when you were learning about it. Because I broke a lot. <laughs> okay, so what I'll do now is I'll show you the reporting services using the cloud as a source. <coughs> Any reporting services fans here? A few people, yeah? I love reporting services, and it makes me happy. It means um, what I like about reporting services is it gives data to the business, and it gives the, the standard reports which organisations tend to need in order to run their business. So although we have lots of very fancy reports in PowerView, Power Pivot, and Excel does some lovely things these days. It's still always a place for reporting services because it works, it's very scalable, and it also allows you a very fine control over the appearance of the report. I think if I'm right, for the SQL Bits conference, they actually use reporting services for the brochure. Russian speaker feedback used reporting services. Alright, thank you. I'll just repeat that. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, the comment I had from Chris who helps to organise SQL bits is that they use reporting services for the brochures and for speaker feedback as well. So it's quite used for a lot of different things and there it's been used for desktop publishing. So reporting services gets everywhere. Yeah. Now, so I'm assuming people haven't seen the SQL Server data tools for reporting services. So I'll just talk a little bit about this before we dive in to look at the Azure report. So what we have here is a shared data sources and basically when you write a report, there are three stages. The first stage is you've got to tell reporting services what source it's looking at. The second thing to do is to tell reporting services what data it should be retrieving. And the third thing you need to do is put those together and then tell the reporting services how you want that report to be displayed. So that's essentially what reporting services does. And this is reflected in SQL Server data tools. What we have here is known as the Solution Explorer. And basically that's where you tell reporting services its data source, the query it should be having, and how the data hangs together. So we have some data sources here, a data set, which is essentially the name for the query which reporting services is retrieving. And then we have a number of reports as well, which tie those two things together. In the middle canvas, we have our report. The bottom right hand side, you've got a small properties window. So if we look at the property of the text box used for the title, then it tells us the height, it tells us things like the font size and the font color, whether it's visible or not. So that's in a nutshell what it does. Now specific to SQL Server Azure, you can actually use SQL Server reporting services and at the moment, but it's a CTP version. What CTP, CTP version means is that it's not quite ready. They're letting people try it so that you can produce bugs, feedback, comments and suggestions back to Microsoft. I talked yesterday about Microsoft Connect, which is one way in which you can feed back information back to Microsoft in terms of the feedback and the suggestions that you might have. So when we look at reporting services, this particular report is using SQL Azure as a data source. It's not using an on-premise SQL server. There's very little difference in writing a report for reporting services for SQL Server Azure than it is for writing one for an on-premise SQL Server. It's very similar. So essentially, this is a data source where we tell reporting services what our source is. When we click on the edit box, what we see here is a server name. Yeah? Again, it's a URL rather than an actual server name itself. As before, 
we have the SQL Server authentication being used with the username and the password, and that allows us to access our SQL Azure instance. Again, we have a database name, which I've simply held as Copper Blue. And that's essentially the theming differences again. We are luckier in some respects in reporting services than we are in SSIS. Because reporting services has a SQL Azure connector, very specific one. When we looked at integration services, we had to use a .NET provider. So it didn't actually say it was for SQL Server Azure. So the only thing, so three things to remember before we move on. First thing, your data source and reporting services can use this Microsoft SQL Azure one. The second thing to remember, you're not using a server name, you're using a URL. For those of you who are used to using reporting services, you'll already know that you use a URL to deploy your reporting services reports because you're deploying them to a reporting services instance. And the same happens in when we deploy a report to reporting services as well. So if we right click and go to properties, you can see a URL here. And that URL actually refers to a reporting services instance which is held in SQL Server Azure. It's a URL which you normally use anyway for a SQL Server instance that's on premise, no difference. So if you are thinking about producing reports that are in the cloud, and it's very similar to what you do already on-premise, it's very little ramp up, but the only thing is it must look great in your CV because you can put cloud computing on it. Yeah. Okay. So if I have internet access, I'll give you a quick tour of the interface. Okay, good. So when you're signed in, you have a big box here called Manage. Even I can see that, it's there. I'll give you a quick tour. Now, the, when you are creating a database in SQL Azure or creating a server, it's actually very, very simple to do that. It's a wizard. So when you think about it, if all you need to use Azure is your Windows Live ID, a credit card, and a facility of being able to use wizards, that means that it's not out of the reach of your business users. Because I really think that business intelligence is all about business users, not just technical aspects of it. So that's a really key, important thing. So if you start to look after SQL Azure, you need to keep an eye to make sure that your business users are not putting databases all over the place. And that's a people issue, it's not a technical one. But at least if you're an Azure administrator, you have a nice browser, in which case you can start to use it in order to look at databases. Okay, he's thinking about it. It's got a nice swish. In the meantime, while that's ramping up, I'll just summarise and I'll go back over some of the things I was hoping to show you in the main deck. Okay, so what we, have, we did was we simply used the SQL Server Azure to put data into it and to use it as a data source for our report. So what we can do quite simply is we can start now to create a SQL Server Azure database. The internet connection is a bit slow, so I don't want to take up too much of your time while the next bubbles tick around. So if it's okay, I'll just use slides instead. If I have any better connectivity later and I'm around, please feel free to come back and just grab me and ask me to show you. And I'm quite happy to take you through it in a sort of one to one basis, that's fine. I'll be floating around the rest of the day. So, if you want to create a server, normally an on premise server, if you're a business user, you have to go away and ask your project manager and all your technical people to work out things like what operating system will go on it, what size should it be, where should it go, who's going to look after it. Azure is very different because they are the stewards or the guardians of your servers. So all they want to do is they just need to know that you need a server. They will look after the scalability and the performance already for you. So do 
If you can imagine you're a business user and you think, right, I need a new database, how do I do that? First thing you do is create a new server. And that's a really simple tick box here. We have a subscription here. And what that means is Microsoft just simply want to know what Windows Live ID you're using that should be associated with this server. So we have a subscription there. And once you've created your new server, it wants to know whereabouts that server should go. We have a number of differences here. We have America, Europe and Asia. Yeah. So you can have great fun deciding where your server should go. I normally stick to Western Europe. So when we create an Azure database, all we need to know is the name of the server that we've actually used. We don't need to type anything. That's a great thing. So we've gone from using, from trying to set up servers internally, choosing licenses, hardware size, education, to simply everything being done via a browser. So what we have here in orange is our option, create a new database. If only it was this easy in the real world. Often it's not the technology, it's the people around us trying to create a new database. I had this recently, I was on a customer site, and they said, we're running out of storage space, we don't want you to create a new database. So I needed a new database, so I created a snapshot of a database instead. <laughs> and the reason I did that was because they never took away the rights for me to create a snapshot, but they did with the database. So I think it was a few weeks before they worked out what I did, and the folks got right as well. So sometimes you have to do these things for you. I think they noticed that 180 gigabits on the computer. <laughs> so, so you create a new database, you click on the link, and all it needs to know again is what subscription you're using and the server name. You click on next, and that's it. You've created your database. I call this database copper blue, so it's really, really simple. That was all we had to do, it was a few clicks. You've got a server, you've got your database. You can imagine how Click, 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 happy a lot of database users are going to be when they realise that they can do this. One thing to note is firewall groups. Now the way the security is managed is via IP address. So you have to be careful that you make sure your IPs are in the right range. Yeah. So if you do what I do, which is move around a lot and use different networks, then I have to make sure my current IP address is in this portal in a firewall room. If it's not, then I can't access it. Yeah. So I'll give you a quick walk through the database. Now, normally when you create a table, you have, well, I write a little script, then I execute it. The only difference between creating a table is in, in your on-premise server and creating a table on your SQL Azure instance is that you need to use a primary key in the Azure instance. And the reason for that is due to the replication. I'm sure Denny can explain it much better than I ever will. And they said, I'll try my best, and then I might ask him to help me. So the way it works is, when you write some data to SQL Azure, you need to, it will take up two instances of that data and replicate it across two instances. But it won't come back and tell you that the data's been written until it's fully written up across the two extra additional ones as well. The reason for that is just trying to make sure that your data is extremely safe and secure. And the most efficient way to do that is by adding in a clustered index here over the primary key. And it's just so it can be sequentially ordered, so that it knows when the data is written properly. Because if it's not got a primary key or not, not get an index on it, basically it's just a heap, so it means it's not organised and it makes it harder for the replication or impossible for the replication to work out when the data's actually been written. So that's the only difference between creating a table in SQL Azure and, and on-premise. On-premise SQL Server lets you away with murder when you create a table, it doesn't like, you don't need key, you know, you don't really need to create keys, but in SQL Azure you do, it enforces that thinking on you. Okay. So just remember to add in those few extra words to your table and job done. So just to summarise some of the SSIS things that we looked at, we populate the Azure table by using the .NET provider. 
Okay. So, and then we looked at reporting services, for instance, as well. As I say, it's just CTP at the minute. Now, I did find a bug the other day, and it was around shares data sets in 2012. So, if you use SQL Server 2008 release 2, you can use shared data sets, which are shared across all the reports in the project. Our local data sources. Local data sources are just specific to that particular report. In 2008, you can deploy a report with a shared data set to SQL Azure and it will work. But for some reason, the XML has changed in reporting services 2012 and it won't accept a shared data set if you use the SQL Server data tools. What you have to do is just stick with the local data set which is specific to that report. It's just a little thing. But I couldn't work out why some of my reports, when I updated them from 2008 to 2012, some of them wouldn't work and some did. And that was the reason. It was because the reports that didn't work had a shared data set. So that's coming back to what I said earlier about it being CTP. There are some bugs in it, but if you can work around them, you can get it to work quite well. So to set up a reporting server instance is very simple. Again, you just need your subscription and it wants to know whereabouts in the world you want to locate your server. One advantage that SQL Azure does have is if you are organising a global organisation, then you can put that server somewhere specific, closer to where your users are, which is not necessarily who you are. Yeah. This is Query Designer in SQL Server Data Tools, which is very simple. I've just basically text boxes and done and collected a SQL Server statement that collects every column. Then when I've created my reports, I've deployed it to SQL Azure reporting services, which is the same as doing it on an on-premise SQL Server via a URL. So when we log into SQL Azure, what we do get is reporting services and it's got a nice interface, I think. That's how it looks. So all you need to do, again, is log in using your Windows Live ID or one of the usernames associated with that Windows Live ID and a password as well. And that's how the completed report looks. What we have here is a very simple grid. You can use charts and controls as well. I just simply put it on a table in order to show the concept. And it's very, very reporting services looking. And it's, there's no difference. The only thing I would say is that some of the drop downs don't work very well. So it will export to Excel but not to PDF, for example. So what you could do is find some workarounds, export it to Excel and then export it to PDF if that's what you needed to do. But for the main part it seems to work so I'm quite happy with it. So we've got 10 minutes before the end. And just to summarise before I take any questions, because I realise it's coming up to lunch, you almost are hungry. Um, what I tried to show you today was how easy it is as a business intelligence developer to pick up the skill set around SQL Azure. So I recommend really that you set up a Windows Live ID if you don't have one and take advantage of the free trial that's in place. The advantages it gives you business are quite tremendous really. It means you can focus on business rather than get two bogs down in IT problems. Now the issue there is that you can cloud everything, nor would you want to, probably. But what you can do is just try it to see if your projects will work, more prototype your projects. It allows for easy sharing as well, and it allows organisations to cater for things like flexibility, scalability, reliability and performance without having to think too much about buying new hardware or new capital expenditure in order to make that happen. The technical benefits is that it's extremely simple to use and because the Microsoft are the guardians of your server, not you, so if anything goes wrong with it, you pick up the phone and you ask about it. I sometimes get asked about downtime. But the issue with the downtime is that I think downtime happens everywhere, whether it's on premise or in the cloud. And I think Microsoft offer a good service level around Azure instances. So thank you for your time today. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them.
Well, thank you very much for your time today. And there's my details, just in case anybody needs them. I am around for the rest of the day, and you're more than welcome to come and ask me. And there's a thank you to our sponsors as well, because, because of today, for them, I wouldn't be here. So I've had a brilliant experience in Poland, so thank you very, very much for having me, and thank you for listening today.